Thanks. So I, I guess I would um, like to ask uh, the, the crowd uh, to, to reflect on some of the comments and themes that we just heard. So I'd, I'd be interested in knowing, um, is there any program right now that is engaging uh, the, the health economists, uh, the payers, the policy uh, um, experts at the point of designing the program as opposed to sort of as a secondary thought or something of that nature? Uh, I would also like to know whether um, uh, any, any groups have really achieved this, uh, this vision of the learning health system that, um, uh, uh, that, it, that requires the bi-directional flow and the virtuous cycle of, of learning. And then the third uh, thing, theme that I think uh, we heard is this notion of contextual evidence and contextual decision making. Uh, so any, any, I see a couple of hands, so I'm going to go with Mark and then Rex. Um, so the um, NIH did sponsor the first uh, um, meeting, to my knowledge, that um, focused on health economics related to uh, several of the uh, uh, funded programs uh, that were in the genomic space. Uh, Terry was at that meeting and a couple of the others were. Now this was more, uh, it was not at the inception of the program, it was more after the fact, but I know that eMERGE 3 um, has as its intent to have economic um, uh, analysis more up front. The comment I would make about economics is that um, uh, having worked in the U.S. payer system quite a bit is it's not something that U.S. payers pay attention to. It, it, they are much, much more interested in what is the impact on the patients, the clinical utility. And if there's demonstrable clinical utility, then they generally figure out a way to pay for it. Now, CMS is somewhat of an exception to that, but it's very different uh, than in national health care systems where you have a global budget and you have to make decisions. That's just not the way it works in this country. So I don't think we should over, I think it's critical, it's very important, but the clinical utility evidence is much, much more relevant to them uh, than the cost effectiveness uh, is. The second thing I would just point out in terms of programs um, that in some ways could affect uh, issues relating to training, but also I think in terms of design, is that there is an NIH Common Fund program in dissemination and implementation science that NHGRI actually contributes to. And uh, some of us have engaged with him over time, uh, and they're very interested in, in, in working with us and figuring out uh, how to do this. David Chambers at NCI is, is, is leading that, and there are funding opportunities through this, and there are uh, training programs uh, that are funded through that as well. So I think that that's an important resource uh, that we haven't leveraged um, uh, quite as much. Um, and I, I think I'll just uh, stop there. So let me just, mind, before Rex, I just want to um, uh, first thank you for bringing up the dissemination and implementation uh, uh, programs. I think that's important to recognize at this meeting. I also wanted to ask you whether you think the Affordable Care Act, accountable care organizations will shift uh, what the current paradigm from what you say of clinical utility focusing on clinical and patient uh, sort of outcomes versus economic ones? It has the potential to do that, um, but again, I think that it's early enough that the, uh, the demonstration projects are still kind of finding their, uh, finding their way and, and figuring out how to do it. And the reality is, is that as little evidence of utility uh, as we have, we have way less evidence of cost effectiveness. And in fact, you can't do cost effectiveness without data on utility. So uh, I, I would still argue that at this point, uh, at this time, uh, more emphasis on the impact on patients of the interventions uh, would be a priority as opposed to the, uh, the cost, although if, um, they are two sides of the same coin. And so uh, if we do think about this intentionally at the outset, then you can develop ways to capture that. I, there is one other thing that I wanted to, to come back to, and that is that um, uh, one of the things as, as I was reviewing the program um, summaries that I was very impressed with was IGNITE and I'm going to emphasize in panel four, is the idea that you guys came together and decided on a set of common outcomes uh, at the outset. And I thought that was extremely um, uh, important and is definitely something that I would highlight as a takeaway, that if we think about commonalities about how to do this across all of the programs, it's going to increase the speed at which we generate evidence. Thanks, Mark. Let me just make one quick more comment and then go on to Rex and, the, and then Howard, um, is that uh, rather than wait for the ACAs or an ACOs uh, 
to, uh, to mature in any way, um, we might have an opportunity as the genomic medicine community to directly engage them because their mandates are to achieve uh, at, you know, cost neutrality or, or better. Um, and are, they're obviously very sensitive to, to the um, management of their costs. So, so it might, it's a similar, I think, system to what the Canadian system and, and others are, uh, uh, just on a, on a very small scale. But we should uh, think about engaging them uh, as an action, at least. Rex? So you said something that I, I guess I'd never really thought about before, but really struck uh, an important chord, uh, especially as we think about uh, learning healthcare systems and how do we really capture evidence. And the, the thing that you said that really struck me was about the quality improvement projects and how quality improvement projects often don't get published. And uh, that really struck me because in, in some ways I know people do quality improvement projects because they don't have to deal with IRBs and a lot of the other complexities that come with publishing. So, you know, maybe one of the things we should be thinking about is how do we think about strategies that maximize people sharing the outcome of their quality improvement projects uh, that don't put them at jeopardy for all the things that maybe make research a little more complicated. And I know that's one of the goals of the idea of a learning healthcare system, but um, uh, of the many great things you said, that one really struck me as something that at least I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about. And maybe if we focused on how do we capture evidence that comes through quality improvement projects uh, and make sure they get disseminated, uh, that would be a really important advance, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Rex. I, I certainly wholeheartedly agree. Howard? So I was on a, a panel last week in the UK, and this topic was brought up as well. And there was, there was a part of this that I actually hadn't thought about, and I don't know if this makes the conversation better or worse, but I'll put that out there, that, you know, the healthcare economists tend to think about qualities as a way of measuring what's the cost of a test versus what do you get in terms of quality of life years afterwards. But in, indeed, this, this other panel member mentioned that a lot of the cost that's associated with healthcare is actually outside the healthcare system. So social services and families actually pay a tremendous amount. And so if we're thinking about the economics, I think somehow we also need to think beyond just the healthcare because it's a much, much bigger number when you think about social services, long-term care, and finances around this. And maybe we're looking at this a little bit too narrow. I think that makes it a little bit more complicated because we're trying to figure out how to do this already with, with one area. But if what we're trying to show is the economics around this, then I think we need to pr potentially get some other people in that can help beyond just the healthcare dollar. So, so um, uh, in our shop, Duke, uh, we're, we're self-insured, so we try to engage our, um, the employer side of the house in helping us figure out whether, you know, about absenteeism and, you know, um, uh, days away from the workforce as, a, as another type of measure, and I, I think that's sort of what you're advocating. Is that right? Okay. I see a number of hands. Uh, let's see. Let's start with Stephen, and then we'll go on to uh, Gail, and then to Mike. Stephen. So I'm glad you started off with evidence, uh, Jeff because it really is becoming, I think, the critical barrier to broader implementation of genomic medicine. Uh, in our insight study, as a stretch goal, we did include a health economist uh, to design um, a cost-effectiveness analysis of genome sequencing in NICU babies. And now that we're into that, about a year and a half, we understand how difficult this is going to be uh, so first of all, you know, you think about, well, if it's true evidence, it has to be prospective, not retrospective. And then we have to think about randomization and what's the control arm, and is that ethical? Uh, so how do we structure that? And then one of the problems with precision medicine, at least in the NICU setting, is the diversity of outcomes. And so it's very different from a traditional uh, design where you have a singular intervention. Uh, instead, in genomic medicine, we have multiple outcomes related to myriad genetic diseases, and so thinking about how to bundle and design those studies and how to have it be testable and powered in a way that can actually show uh, at the end of the day clinical effectiveness is, is not easy at all. Thanks, Stephen. And before we go to Gail, I want to ask maybe Pierre or others on the panel. Um, so uh, are, are you across, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about uh, Genome Canada and the GAPH, are you 
uh, are you developing uh, standard ways to think about the economic analyses? Uh, are they program specific? Um, are you sharing uh, and the learnings across your programs that inform study design and the kinds of outcome measures that Stephen just mentioned and some of the other issues? Yeah, so the, the complications are huge and, and, and each uh, type of disease setting will have its own uh, issues in terms of articulating the value to, uh, and it's not only the, I, maybe I was too <laughs> direct in my, in my thoughts, it's not only to do with the, the health system. There are obviously social values that we need to integrate as well. So I come back to the rare disease issue, because that, it, it appears to me that that on, on one end of the spectrum, that is a fabulous uh, model system to look at some of these things, because one can take, um, and, and we're doing this within the project uh, on rare diseases, is to uh, look at the articulating the value in terms of not only the how, much, how many dollars have been spelt, spent within the healthcare system in terms of um, uh, the, uh, looking after the diagnostic odyssey in these, in these families? And some of those, as you know, go on for 10 years, 15 years, whatever. So that, there's that dollar figure uh, compared to, and if you implement genome, whole genome sequencing, what, does, what, 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 what is that? So that's a very favorable uh, in most cases, uh, scenario. But as well, you have the social, emotional, and other things that go around the, the impacts that, that this has, that genomic medicine can have on, on the families and the way they live and, and, and so on and so forth. So that is much more complicated to put an ROI on, I agree. But I think it, it can be articulated in a way that gives patients uh, a, quite a strong weapon to say, you know what, in terms of access, we should have, as a group, we should have access to this technology and uh, change policies in, in that way. And that's an angle that we're very keen on in Canada because of the uh, socialized medicine uh, um, uh, organization we, ha we have there. So I think, uh, yes, it's very, very challenging to, to put a, a, a dollar, a healthcare dollar figure on some of these, but I think mobilizing patient groups uh, can be a very powerful uh, weapon in us trying to, well, why would you not do this? Give me some arguments why you would not uh, incorporate some of this new technology in some of these key areas. And I can see this, so if, if the rare disease thing is, is at one end of the spectrum, then you can see that, you know, things around pharmacogenomics, things around cancer, which are, are, which are uh, very, being very, very progressive at the moment, uh, we'd have some uh, very interesting arguments to give, as well as the hopefully a positive uh, ROI as well. That's very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Pierre. Gail? So I have to say that in my experience, insurers are very interested in the cost analyses. Um, what we get pushed back from when we try and order panel tests in clinic is they tell us very directly, we don't want a panel, we know one gene at a time will cost more potentially, but we think the VUSs you find on your panel will cost us more money downstream. And so we prefer to test one gene at a time, which is not very efficient. So the kind of cost outcomes analyses that compare, like we recently published panel testing versus smaller panel or single gene testing, not only inform the insurers, but they inform practice guidelines, which is how the insurers make some of their decisions. So to that end, in the CSER consortium, uh, two sites at least, including ours, have a randomized controlled trial that includes cost outcomes as one of their outcomes, as well as patient reported outcomes, uh, surveys of what patients' preferences are, et cetera. But I think that building those in up front, and, and if you're going to say, how do we use this technology in a clinic, evaluating it in every way possible it can be efficient. Do you think um, the payers would actually co-invest? In, in those actual studies? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, that's an excellent question. I think Mike was next. So just in this um, 
this um, rush to fill the gap with evidence. Um, there's a, there, uh, in some areas, there, there seems to be a settling for a lower quality type data in this sort of patients like me approach um, where databases are emerging and clinicians are beginning to use data um, uh, from smaller and smaller cells of clinical databases as if it's gone through the strict, rigorous um, evaluation. We, we, we're beginning to see some of that in this uh, learning healthcare system where they'll use, beginning to use data, whether it's QI that's, that's done rather rudimentary or in the cancer panels where there's small cells of patients that happen to look like a given panel that, that is pushing toward uh, clinical decisions. And, it, and to me, it seems like we've, we need to um, caution against the rush toward using whatever evidence comes down the pike and that there needs to be a very, the tradi more traditional rigorous approach to the evaluation of some of this data that's coming from large systems um, be before we uh, uh, will allow us to do that kind of clinical uh, utility and then cost utility analyses. Where is the epicenter of, of actually making the decisions about le quality of evidence, the size of the data structures? What, what do you see this happening? I mean, I, I know we're, we're talking about it, but is this the group or should we, I'm just trying to understand, you know, how do we take those concepts forward and, and get a little bit more organized in our thinking? So, I, well, I just, I think that it, a general discussion about the development of evidence needs to consider the the full range of the types of evidence that we're using for clinical implementation. And I think it's not just pharmaceuticals, there's those who are selling diagnostics, and sometimes in the area of diagnostics, we do a little less, as long as we can measure something, it gets an approval, and there's much less work done downstream on the clinical utility of a diagnostic. And in some of the cancer, the, the heterogeneity in the precision oncology programs, um, vendor to vendor to vendor, where they're um, marketing different forms of cancer profiling, um, where there's variability in the, in the um, precision oncology databases, the size and the interpretation of the data. There's certainly no standard. Right. Um, people are using different types of profiling. Um, and I think it's wonderful to move the field forward, but that, that data needs to be assessed very carefully in terms of long-term clinical um, utility before um, it gets pushed to a payer and before you can begin to even think about doing the kinds of cost-benefit analyses that we're suggesting here today. I think this will be the last uh, question before, well, Terry, you were flashing me warning signs. Do you have a question or? Okay. <laughs> so you have a conflict of interest, but uh, I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> so I, I think we have to be careful about the term payer I mean, as someone who orders genetic testing, the payers don't agree. You know, as Gail said, there's some that say, just give me a single gene. There are other payers that say, as long as you don't, if the X film's cheaper, we'll pay for that than all these panels. There are others that say, order a panel. So I think part of the problem is there's not a payer. We're not in a national health service. And so I think it's important to mandate that future studies look at cost effectiveness. But I think we, we have to be a little bit careful that there's not a payer. And the other thing I would say is context, again, really matters. They're, the public is really pushing to not require a double-blind phase three trial for every FDA approval, and that for rare diseases, that's almost impossible to do. Um, and so I think also depending on the medical context, the level of evidence may differ. Yeah, no, uh, you're echoing things that we, we, we fully agree on. And also, I, I think we learned from uh, GM four or five uh, about the heterogeneity of the, of the payer community, and, and I apologize for lumping them all into one group. Okay, Terry, uh, less than a minute? Uh, yeah, well, so, so two things. One is, is are, are you going to do the summation from up there, or um, because, it, you know, we could go a few minutes longer and, okay. and stretch into the break if it's a, if it's a good discussion. I'm, I'm willing to give it a whirl if you uh, want to. Uh, I'm willing to try. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's great. So just wanted to be sure that one of us was doing it. Uh, so, uh, my, my comment is, is um, 
you know, evidence and quality and types in that definitions of came up actually at our GM6 meeting, our global leaders meeting. Uh, remember Aravinda said, well, you know, who is it who defines what evidence is and, and shouldn't we have some criteria for it? And, and I don't think that we've pursued that and perhaps it is something that we should consider um, needs a, a, a broader discussion maybe in one of these meetings or elsewhere. So um, I think I'm a little short on time and I want to give the panelists um, one last shot um, in, in a game called Password, which um, many of you are, are too young to remember. Uh, there was something called the lightning round. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, 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 for a lightning round. Um, that's uh, 30 seconds plus or minus to give us your top level thoughts on the key messages that came from this discussion. So and I'm going to play a little jingle while this is going on. No. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, either the right or the left. I'll start. Okay, thanks, John. Um, test performance, we need to find out what it is for genomic medicine, um, clinical scenario, and what evidence is necessary in those, in those settings. Okay, Pierre? Yep. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. No matter. So I think one of the things was uh, the whole evidence um, threshold and teasing out the rare disease from the common disease um, and the um, importance of engaging the, uh, understanding what the payer's needs are, even if there's no single payer that you're talking about. Uh, and I would just say that uh, I, I think the, the role of the patients in this is going to be a major uh, thread going forward. Uh, and I think uh, they're going to be very important in changing policy, which will allow some of this technology to uh, be more uh, uh, accessible uh, when, when it's required. Great, thanks. Um, so I, I, I'm going to try to do some synthesis of what we talked about uh, along the lines of the outline that uh, Terry uh, put up uh, in one of her last slides. And so the first is the critical knowledge and gaps for evidence, I think uh, what we uh, talked about today were um, understanding where the goalposts lie for the various uh, stakeholder communities. Um, so that's a gap, I guess. A uh, an approach would be the kinds of approaches that um, both Genome Canada has have taken on to assemble many of those uh, uh, key decision makers up front in the process. And it also sounds like some of the programs, like Caesar and perhaps others, are, are taking a similar uh, approach. Um, that um, the harnessing of the, of the health system data has come up, uh, particularly for comparative effectiveness research, uh, as, a, uh, as a gap, I would say, uh, and, the, and that kind of ties into the lack of unified systems. Uh, as I just mentioned, um, we have gaps in test performance and in contextual thinking and in patient engagement. Uh, so those, I think, would be some. I, one that we didn't talk about, but I, I think is important and probably will come up later in the day, is, is just having uh, deep phenotyping associated with the genetic information um, as well as uh, longitudinal data that, that allows us to know how to tie the genetic information in an evidentiary way to, to outcomes uh, uh, that may tie into the to the, to the to the lack of a learning health system framework that most of us suffer from. Uh, so key barriers to implementation, um, the fragmentation of the communities, uh, the um, uh, the uh, lack of, uh, of IT infrastructure and standards. Uh, I think what, what sort of came up in a, in a sort of tangential way is who pays for all this uh, evidence generation. Uh, we're, we're fortunate to have NHGRI paying for it or the Canadian government or other governments uh, funding it through um, research initiatives, but um, uh, is that really aligned with, uh, with whom ultimately is going to achieve the benefit of our doing so? Um, so, uh, and, and I know we can't um, afford uh, to pay uh, to support the data generation around um, you know the, the millions of variants that are being generated on a, on a regular basis. Approaching the gaps, um, I think um, uh, Pierre recommended that we really embrace the rare disease uh, model um, and uh, and the learning from that, and then move from rare disease to more common disease or some other uh, areas like pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics, as well as to um, more strongly engage the patients. I would. I guess I will hear across the day, and maybe it's in our booklet, but I'm not sure how many uh, uh, of the programs are, 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 are really optimally using uh, patient 
uh, gener generated um, information. I, I know we heard from you, Gail, but maybe others are, are not quite as uh, adept. Um, in terms of training needs and approaches, um, uh, we listed some of our recommendations. I think Mark added to that by uh, encouraging that the dissemination implementation program uh, become an opportunity for, for, for training. Uh, we didn't really have a chance to discuss that at any great length um, in the course of the uh, discussion. And then lastly, I guess uh, Terry had asked us to comment on, on facilitating uh, the virtuous cycle. And I think um, what, what it comes back to is really enabling uh, the learning health system idea. Um, I think the, uh, I'm glad Rex, uh, um, you know, um, raised the QI opportunity um, where those programs exist. They're, they're probably very opaque to most of us, um, unless you know that something is going on in your own institution and you may not even know that. Um, but you probably are, in, since you are the leaders of genetic and genomic medicine in your institutions, I guess if you were doing a QI project in that area or the hospital or health system where you would know more about it. But I think that's, that clearly is an important component of learning health systems from an administrative point of view. Can we actually embrace it from a genomic medicine uh, point of view? Um, and um, I think the, uh, uh, the notion of, um, of I, that didn't come up, but I think the notion of, 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 of developing some larger surveillance programs. Uh, I think, Gail, you probably have written about this along with others, is to, to, to think about how to um, monitor what happens uh, after a test is commercialized and really get the, uh, the breadth of, of information that is being generated in day-to-day -day clinical care outside of the research programs that are actually generating the evidence to bring things to the marketplace. There's a wealth of data that isn't being captured by laboratories and by commercial firms once a, once a test is from fully developed and on the market. So I think those are my, my thoughts uh, from what you said. I'm sure I missed a few of the key points, but I know Terry and Howard have been uh, uh, meticulously capturing everything you said. And <laughs> Last comment, Howard, do you, you have something you want to say? Well, I, I, there is time if others have comments that have come out of your conclusions. I think that, you know, there is no a, a test equivalent of pharmacovigilance that uh, currently that is widely applied. And so your comment about what happens post-marketing is, is a good one. Some companies are better than others in terms of trying to do those studies, but they're often driven more from marketing than they are from uh, truly utility and, and such. Uh, and, and so I think there's some opportunities for, for us to create that sort of thing in some level. It's never easy. It's not like pharmacovigilance is running perfectly uh, in this country, so uh, I, you know, we can script the test version of that as well, I guess. Um, but I think that there, there are some opportunities to really ask those questions. The, the other thing that we kind of, you know, you, even in your slide, you talked about the, the high value or then the low value or the high bar or low bar. The vast majority of the questions are in the middle. Um, almost always in medicine, it's a, it's a choice amongst equals uh, as opposed to awesome versus not awesome. And, and I think there's some opportunities to go in and, because the, the level of evidence, coming back to Mike's comment, the level of evidence there is very different uh, than you know, should you not use something amazing. Uh, and, and so I think there's some things that we can push on uh, both now, but also throughout the remaining of the sessions on, on try to really get at how do we tackle some of those hard things, because you know, that's where a lot of the decisions are. Thanks, Howard. I guess just one reaction to your pharmacovigilance and an analog for genomic medicine. It would seem that um, that the Precision Medicine Initiative, even though we don't know much about its ultimate form, um, would desperately need that as a component and maybe even have some resources to support it. Just a thought. I don't know if, uh, if that's, if that is, that's going to ultimately be true. I want to thank uh, all of you for your input and engagement uh, into the first panel. Also, Gwerver Nipir and Jonathan for uh, their insights and participation. And I hope uh, the rest of the, I hope you found this productive, and I hope the rest of the day and tomorrow are, are equally so. Thanks. All right, well, we will uh, reconvene at 1044 to give us a minute to settle in for our 1045 uh, start.